Um, so it's my great pleasure this evening to be able to introduce two distinguished writers, but more than distinguished, they're also really nice people. And I think I need to say this because what comes across in their writing is very much their own personal take on the stories that they tell. And it's not in any kind of um, indulgent or autobiographical or individualistic way, but it's an understanding of the humanity that is behind the stories that we remember with fondness and that we also remember with a little bit of nostalgia. So um, what the, the reason we chose the theme of the evening was to try and give a sense that what we're talking about now is um, a phenomenon that touches us all quite deeply, the global mobility of populations, um, a global mobility that we're very aware of here in Australia, but that has become much more diffuse, and a global mobility that has resulted in a kind of appartenenza which is difficult to define, so the not being here, not being there, but not in a, in a sense of having lost something, but possibly of having gained something. And I think this will come through very clearly in what they're going to present. So let me introduce our two authors without further ado. Amara Lacus, sitting right next to me, was born in Algiers and has until very recently been living in Rome. He's just recently moved to Torino. So I look forward to his third novel, uh, which will be based in Torino, um, has a degree in philosophy from the University of Algiers, another degree in cultural anthropology from the University of La Sapienza in Rome, and a PhD on the um, aspects of Islam in Italy. I'm sure he'll mention those a little bit later. He, Amara's novels experiment very much with language, um, and he has already, in two novels that have been enormously successful, and I can say this with confidence as someone who's worked in contemporary literature for many years, both novels have been translated into English. That is no mean achievement for someone writing in Italian. Very few Italian novels are actually translated into English. So that in itself is a mark of um, international recognition and has won several prizes. Archimede Fusillo is much closer to home in the sense that he was born and grew up in Melbourne. Um, Archimede tells us, and it's evident in his writing, that he was surrounded by wonderful storytellers, which has turned him into a wonderful storyteller. Um, he has um, written a couple of novels, has won a couple of prizes, and is, in, from my point of view, embarking on something which I think will be very interesting, a possibility of having one of his novels translated into Italian. And if we can write back to Italy doing this, we'd be very interested to see the results. Amala gave me an in. He said, choose a language. Choose a, which language? When I was a, a little boy, I had many languages. At home, I had what I thought was Italian. <laughs> it was dialect. And so, I spoke dialect at home. I didn't know English. English was a foreign language. I was born in Australia. It's an odd thing to say. But for the first five and a bit years of my life, English was a foreign language. It was something that others spoke. I spoke to my nonna, my grandmother, in what I thought was Italian. And therefore, you'd hear words when I went to school and we were taught formal Italian. And we would argue that Chemista was a real word. <laughs> and puta path was a real word. And fenza was a real word. Choose a language. I think that's the thing that my father taught me most. That there was a need to choose a language. My father was very proud to be Italian. My father was very proud of his language. My father was very proud that he spoke dialect. But my father insisted that we also, in some way, learn Italian. But I'd like to begin by talking about the impact it had on me, language, and how language very often makes you feel dislocated. Language can be inclusive, and language can separate you. And I didn't understand that as a child, because I didn't understand the power of language. You make an important quote I, I read of yours, and you said, and I hope I get it correct, you said, one acquires freedom through language. 
You also said the ability to communicate offers status. When I read those two comments, it rang so true for me. And I'd like to give you an anecdote. When I was a, a little boy, I went to a lot of parties, of course. All my cousins had birthday parties and had communions and confirmation. And so we went to these parties. There was no need for a formal invitation. Not yet an invito. You just turned up and went. But I played football. I played uh, football in the park. And in playing football, I made friends with people who were not Italian. And I made friends with a particular young man who was Anglo-Saxon. And so one day, he did me the great courtesy of inviting me to his party. He didn't just invite me, he gave me a sheet of paper. An invitation, which I'd never seen before. I'd never seen an invitation before. And so I, I took the invitation home. I could read some of it. But there were three words printed at the bottom, which I did understand. And the three words are quite simple. The three words were, bring a plate. <laughs> bring a plate. And so I went to my mother, cara mamma, and I said, Mamma, sono stato invitato a un compleanno, questo invito. My mother went, oh, you have an invitation. Oh, this is very, very nice. And then my mother read it and said, when's the party? I said, it's at uh, so-and-so's house. This is the date. And then she looked at it and I said, what's the problem? She said, what does this mean? I said, ah, bring a plate. I said, I have to bring a plate. <laughs> she said, you're going to a party and you have to bring a plate. I said, yes. She said, so you're going on a picnic. I said, no, I'm going to a party, I have to bring a plate. And I had no idea what that meant. So we took it literally. <laughs> so I said to my father, Baba, I'm going to a party, I have to bring a plate. My father said, oh, well, no, 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 let's, let's, let's uh, not make a scene. Let's make sure you bring a nice plate. <laughs> And so my mother went through all our cupboards looking for a, what would be a nice plate. She couldn't find them. We had lots of plates, but she couldn't find the plate that she thought was a nice plate. And so in order not to embarrass ourselves and not to embarrass my mother and my father, my mother went to Victoria Market and she bought a plate. She bought a beautiful jade plate. She also bought some ribbon and she bought some cellophane paper. And my mother wrapped this plate in cellophane paper and with a ribbon. She also bought a gift, a little Archie. It was about that tall, about that wide. It was my grandmother fed me. I went to the party, I said, hello, my name is Archie, I've come for the party. This is a gift, and this is a plate. And the lady said, I beg your pardon. I said, okay. I said, my name is Archie, this is a gift, this is a plate. She said, you brought a plate. I said, yes, I brought a plate. And so we went inside. And there was this beautiful table all laid out of all these beautiful desserts on them. And she put my plate there. And she unwrapped my plate. And of course my plate was empty. She said, Archie, you brought a plate. I said, yes. I said, bring a plate. I brought a plate. She said, why did you bring a plate? I said, it said, bring a plate. I brought a plate. And the lady said, but your plate is empty. I said, yes, it's a plate. <laughs> but she was very kind. She said, Archie, go and play. So Archie went off to play. And a couple of hours later, we came inside and we cut the cake and we sang happy birthday. I just stood there because I didn't know how to sing it in English. And then she gave us each a gift. She gave us all a lolly bag. And I took the lolly bag. And then she also said, Archie, this is also for you. And she gave me the plate. And I said, what's this? She said, it's the plate. Mm -hmm. But this time the plate had biscuits in it. And she'd wrapped it again. She said, Archie, please take this home to your mother. I said, oh, thank you. She said, tell your mother, we appreciate the plate. But obviously you need the biscuits more than we do. <laughs> so I went home, and in that innocent way that children do, and in the limited language that I had, I said, Mum, the lady said, because we've got the birthday. And then I said in English, she said, we need the biscuits more than they do. And my mother started to cry. And at the time, I didn't understand what that meant. And it wasn't until much, much later that I understood. But I bring that up to show how powerful language can be. And how not having language can sometimes disassociate us from our society and it can set us apart. And I realised that when I went to school, when I finally went to school, I didn't have the language I also had what was considered then a very strange name, Archimede, Archimede. And no one could pronounce my name. 
And they used to call me Ahmed, Ahmud, Achu, and any variation. And so the teachers decided that it was better just to call him Archie. And so Archie, who didn't speak English, and Archie, who thought he spoke Italian, was suddenly at, at school with no English, no Italian, because it was dialect, and I was totally lost. And bit by bit, I started to understand the dislocation my parents felt because they didn't have the language. But oddly enough, as I stayed at school and I learned English, something interesting also happened. Because I was at school and because I was expected to learn English, the roles at home started to change. And little by little, I became the adult in many otherwise adult-only transactions. My parents both had found Italian-speaking doctors, so that wasn't a problem. But when it came time to go to the city council or go see a, a lawyer, Archie was brought along. I was seven or eight years old. My grasp of English was minimal at best, but it was more than my parents had. And so my parents trusted in me to be able to speak on their behalf. Only now do I understand what a burden that is for them and what enormous responsibility that must have been for me. I didn't understand it at the time. I really didn't understand any of that until much, much later. Much later. I started to understand it when I was at school and I realised I had an advantage over my parents because I had English, something they didn't have, or at least they didn't have in the same way that I did. Because I went to school and because I learnt English and because I was around people who spoke English, I went home and I insisted that we speak English at home. I said to my father, you've been in this country long enough. Aren't you embarrassed that you don't speak English? My father said, but I speak English, good. I said, Dad. I said, I'm embarrassed to bring my friends home. Why? Because my father, God bless him, my father would not say to someone, excuse me, what's your name? My father would say, hey, which name you got? <laughs> and I would find that really embarrassing. My father would not say to my friends, how come I haven't seen you in a long time? My father would say, hey, why I don't see you long distance? <laughs> So there was this bastardization of the language and I thought I was superior because I knew grammatically how English should be spoken. And so I used it to my advantage. And so I would tell my parents things, for example, that they weren't expected to understand because they didn't have the language. And so if I got suspended from school, I was sent home early. My father would ask me, why are you home? I would say, well, Daddy, in Australia things are different. In Australia, if you're like me, you work very, very hard in school like I do. The teachers have to give you time off until their brothers catch us up. That's what being suspended means in Australia. And so we had all these advantages of language. But I didn't really understand them until I was 10 years old. And when I was 10 years old, my father took us all back to his paese. He, had, he hadn't been back for 20 years. We went back. And I remember we, we arrived at the village and we pulled up in a little minivan and it was drizzling and I was 10 years old and I got out of the minivan and then my father stepped out and my father stopped and my father looked around and my father recognised a little fountain which was outside his, the home where he was born and my father started to cry and I looked at my father because I'd never seen my father cry before I said, Baba Perché piangi? Why are you crying? I said, why upset you, Dad? He said, no, figlio, no. I said, Dad, why are you crying? He said, well, right now, I don't think you can understand. And it wasn't until many years later that he said to me, he said, let me explain to you why I was crying. He said, I was excited to be back in my own village. He said, but at that moment, I realised that I didn't belong there, and I really didn't belong in Australia. He said, my village and my people had moved on and I'd gone elsewhere. And he didn't use the word dislocation because my father wouldn't have used that term. But he said, I felt apart. And what set him apart was the language. And this seems quite trivial. But looking back now, I realise that even the young people of his village, to which my father was connected through his dialect, through the native language, they had moved on. Very few of them spoke fluent dialect anymore. 
They had gone to school, they were educated, and they spoke fluent Italian. And my father found that when he spoke the language that he remembered from his childhood and his teenage years, they no longer used that language. And so my father, not only did he not have English, he didn't have his dialect anymore. And so he was a person in transition. And what's really interesting about that is that it made me realise that so was I. I'm the son of migrants, but I was myself in transition, caught between those two places. And it only dawned on me much later that I never read those stories. No one ever told me the stories about the experiences of the migrant. Oh, we had stereotypical stories. The Nonna always wore black. The Greeks always owned fish and chip shops. The Italians always worked in factories on concrete. But they weren't really my stories. No one ever wrote those stories down. And so I made a promise. The promise was that one day, if I mastered the language sufficiently, I would start to tell the stories. The stories that are tied to language. The stories that are tied to identity. The stories that are tied to place. And I was very lucky to have a teacher who believed that those stories were worth telling. And so I started telling the stories of my nonna, again linked to language. My poor nonna, who didn't speak much English at all, I would tell my nonna, for example, that for sale, the sign for sale, that S-A-L-E, they used the Italian word sale. <laughs> and what that meant in Australia was that Australia made so much salt that occasionally there was too much salt in Australia. And when there was too much salt in Australia, what the government did is they erected these signs to allow you to take a pot and go stand next to this sign that said for sale, and a truck would come and give you all the salt you wanted. And my poor nonna would go and take her friends with her with a pot and wait for a truck to turn up to deliver the salt. That's the tyranny of language. That's the tyranny of language. And so when I write, I try, if I manage, to tell the stories of that dislocation, to tell the stories that haven't been told, to tell the stories that perhaps need to be told, to tell the stories that I wanted to read, the stories I wanted to hear from my father, that I wasn't so different, that we weren't certainly apart. We were just trying to fit in. We were trying to find our way. And I was trying to find my way through the language. And the language became a cement. My father did something extraordinary, I think, for someone of his generation. My father left school when he was very young. He left because he had to. His father died. They couldn't afford to keep him at school. And I would watch my father sit at the kitchen table and he would pour over a book and I would watch him. I didn't know what it was he was doing until much later. My father died about a year ago. And one of my most precious possessions of my father is this little book here. In English, in three minutes. It's got my father's signature at the top. That is my touchstone to language. Because my father would sit and he would pour over this book to teach himself English. And then he would buy the newspaper and he would try to read the newspaper from cover to cover with this book beside him so that he could look up the verbs, look up words he didn't understand. That is an amazing thing for someone to do. For someone who left school when they were about eight years old. And so what my father did, because he realised the importance of language and the importance of, the, of our stories, my father would sit me down and he would try and teach me, not just verbs in Italian, he would try and teach me the English verbs. Because my father believed wholeheartedly that language is power, that language is freedom, that language does give you a certain status. As a writer, I'm very privileged to use language. And we have to be careful as writers that we don't abuse language. I try to tell stories as simply as I can. I try to tell stories that are true. And with your permission, I'd like to read a little bit, if I may. And I read a little bit that I always dedicate to my, to my parents. This is from my first novel, Sparring with Shadows. This is the story of growing up, the sun, the children of migrants. This is the story of what it's like to be an outsider even when you're born in this country. 
when people assume that English is your first language, but it's not. Your first language is some dialect from some little remote village that leaves you really nowhere. You don't have English, you don't have Italian, you have this, this dialect. <coughs> this scene happens when David, the protagonist, brings an Anglo-Saxon boy home for lunch for the first time. An Anglo-Saxon boy is allowed into the house to sit and have lunch with the Martinez family. David, the main character, has just gone to the cafe to, the cafe to call his father. Come to lunch, you have to be there now. Mum says you have to be there now. He oversteps the mark. This is what happens. Slowly, his words chosen carefully, my father spoke. He looked at each of us in turn, sitting at the table. Even Nathan, the Australian. When I come to this country, my father began, I had not much more than the shoes on my feet and the suitcase I carry on the ship. I don't have my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, no uncles, no aunties. Like much of them what comes before me, I got not much for myself. What I got is a dream to make better my life, to make better the life of my family which I leave behind me. It was my duty, my responsibility to make money and send it back to my mother. She comes to rely on me to send back to her some money, what she can put aside for sending herself and my brother here. To this country, I tell them, it was too good, too beautiful, to so much space. Not like my village, which got one tiny house leaning one against the other. They looked like toy house for the doll, not for people. I was young when I came here to this country, he said. He looked up, but all of us were looking away except me. I was looking at my father. My father looked straight at me. I am not ashamed who I am, because I know I come here to make better my life and my family life. But not everyone here know this, so I get called lots of names from people who think I come here free of charge. They think my voyage was paid by government to come to Australia and make myself a rich man. But that not how it was, not at all. I come to this country of money borrowed from someone who can afford the cost, but not government. I never got government money, never. Not even I know what it is to be unemployed. I never got, I never out of work. I work all the time in this country. I work hard night and day, sometimes go straight one job to another, don't sleep. I live with three other young men just like me, together in a bungalow where we share three rooms. Not three bedrooms, you understand, just three rooms, one, two and three. But like me, them two work hard, send money back to their family in Italy. Money that can be used to feed their mother, father, brother, sister and so on. My father paused, he coughed as I had cleared his throat. With time, me lucky enough to find a good and strong woman who loved me enough to come be my wife. And slowly, slowly, together from nothing, we make something. But this one not easy. I felt my father's shadow at my back. I saw it lean lightly across the table. I swallowed but couldn't say a word. For the first time, I just listened to my father. When you're young, my father said, when you're young, you believe only you can know the way to do this and that. You think you're so strong you can make the moon rise, the sun shine. You think in your head that in future you always have more than what you've got. But you discover all that you grow is not always true. Sometimes what you've got is everything you ever have. And you need to learn to be happy with this. Other things you have nothing. Today, my son David, David, he came call me from lunch. But he called me like I was his brother. I cringed. I felt my father's humiliation. He can do this because he's young. Because he's lucky he learned the language. But not me. But I say to my son, yes, you're very lucky. You're very lucky, my son. My son have eyes to look forward, not back. Eyes to see where he's going. But maybe not enough to see where he comes from. And him decide he's not going where I want him to go. But you know what's funny? I never say to my son, you must do this, you must do that. It is my son who believes this about me. My son, he confused hope with expectation. I thought I heard my mother sigh, but it was my sister Rose staring right at me. I blinked once hard and looked back at the tablecloth, wishing my father would stop. But he didn't. He had one more thing to say. I learned one thing about what it means to be a stranger, to be always looking in. I learned it is a good thing to leave 
rather than always to follow. I learned you must learn to fit in. You learn the language. Maybe then someone take you for real. My father stood up. He pushed his chair back. I didn't look at my father. I looked at my hands. I couldn't look at my father. His words were ringing in my head. I started to remember my father and the things I'd said and the things I'd done. Without a word, my father moved past me. He stopped, but not behind me. He stopped behind my friend Nathan. Mr. Nathan, my father said. My son, him a thinker, not just a worker like his father. And for this, I am very, very proud. I'm very happy. Because that's why I come here. Because my son, he learned a language, he'd be much more better than me. So I think that language is powerful. Stories are powerful. Language engages us. Language can disengage us. One of the most important things I've realised over the last couple of years is that we take words on board and we can kill them. For my father, words like wog, dago were menacing words. The words that cut him, that hurt him. But luckily we have reappropriated those words. We've taken them on board. And what we've done is we've lessened the connotations of those words. And we've done it because we've embraced our stories. We've embraced our words. We've embraced our language. I wish I spoke in, uh, Italian better than I do. I speak it enough to be understood. And I think I speak it enough to honour my father and my mother. Because if I abandoned their native language completely, then really what I'm doing is I'm abandoning something of myself and my heritage and who I am. But more importantly, I think, I abandon who I might become. I am a writer, but I like to think I'm much more than that. Maybe, in some way, I chronicle the life of people who have stories to tell, but maybe, maybe just lack the language to tell them. Thank you.